Fred Albert. He is the leader of the American Federation of Teachers, West Virginia branch. Good morning, Fred. Great to have you with us. Good morning. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Bill. And good morning, John. And uh, it is a beautiful morning. You know, I would echo what you all have said about the beauty of our state. I'm, of course, housed along the Great Kanawha River. And uh, looking out my office window, it is absolutely spectacular this morning. And I'm a, I'm a little surprised because of all the dry, hot weather we yes. had. I didn't think the leaves would be this beautiful, but they are absolutely uh, something to behold. Yeah, they've, they've exceeded even the predictions that those who are supposed to know these things made about a month ago about what this fall would look like. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's sure. right. Fred, so how much, much for predictions? <laughs> how much? How much longer will that be your office? By the way, not not much longer. I am uh, getting ready to pass the torch. Uh, we have an election coming up in November uh, at our state convention, and uh, I'm going to be bowing out. But I will still hang around. Uh, I'll be here to help with the transition, and of course, I will continue to be a vice president of AFT national so uh i'm I'm still gonna i have work to do but i won't be in this office uh that much longer so fred there'll be a someone else uh elected as president or chair uh for just a few months until they go through the merger is that right well uh not really because when we do go through the merger and you know the merger between aft west virginia and wbea uh is on track to occur in September of 2025. And then there will be a period of transition where both of the leaders of AFT West Virginia and WVEA will continue serving in co-capacities um, until new leadership would be elected uh, of the new organization. It's still yet to be named, but no, they'll, they'll, they'll still be here uh, leading uh, together uh, through that transition period. It'll, okay. it'll take a little while. Okay. Well, Fred, let me just say on behalf of this show, I very much appreciate your availability and your affability as well, as we've done many well, interviews over the years. It's always been my pleasure, and I appreciate the work that you do, and, and Bill and John, and I, it's it's been my pleasure to be a guest from time to time. Hey, yes. Go ahead, John. Uh, historically, we're the, before the merger and leading up, well, historically, in previous years, were there friction points between the two organizations that had to be overcome to get to the merger point? Well, yes, uh, to be perfectly honest. You know, we we both uh, have found through the merger talks that, of course, we have more in common than we have that uh, brings difference to us. We have more that uh, we work in the same vein uh, to accomplish. So, but we have had a history of, you know, going after the same members. Um, we've had a history of we only have so many people to organize here in West Virginia. And there have been times that it's been pretty contentious, but we have put that behind us. Uh, th this is not a personal agenda. This is an agenda to make public education better in our state. Uh, to work for our students and our uh, teachers and our service personnel. So, yes, while there have been moments in the past, uh, we, we've put that behind us, and we're looking for a brighter future. Between the two organizations, uh, Fred, uh, prox what's, what percent of the teachers are represented? Well, that's a very good question because that fluctuates. Uh, we have, I think, roughly 25 uh thousand teachers in West Virginia and about uh, 15,000, maybe 10 to 15,000 service personnel, uh, you know, that are employees. We don't have, uh, well, both, both AFT and, and WBEA, we have about the same uh, number of members, uh, close to being the same number, but the percentage that I, I don't have that in front of me right at the moment but we have uh there are more members that uh we would like to have um for whatever reason uh and hopefully they will be that'll be something that comes out of the new organization maybe perhaps those who have not uh, been interested in the past will be interested in the new organization so uh we have we have work to do uh, my 
uh, motto is don't or, don't agonize, organize. And we I have like uh, potential members out there that we would love to have joined uh, us now or in the future. Did you see a reduction in union members, Fred, when the law was passed that prevented payroll deduction for union dues? Honestly, yes, because, uh, you know, we had a program, uh, an agreement with county boards of education in the past where uh, dues were deducted from their paycheck if they so desired. or They've always had the ability to write a check and, and pay cash up front if they so desired. So that, that did confuse some people. And, you know, even though that happened three years ago, we still have people who call and, and think they're a member um, because they think <laughs> that, that their dues are still being deducted for whatever. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe they don't look at their paycheck stub. Maybe they don't get a paycheck stub because most everyone's paid through a direct deposit now. But mm -hmm. we still have people who are confused on that matter. But it, it did uh, it did change the way we have to do business. But we've we've done a nice job, I think, of recovering. Um and but I'm going to be real honest with you. Of course, that did hurt because uh, and, and I think, you know, that was perhaps the intent of that whole bill was to uh, silence us. But it didn't happen. Fred, from the outside looking in, uh, the merger appears to make a lot of sense. Uh, yes. The uh, uh, for a host of reasons. Who really drove the, uh, the, the, con the thought of the merger? Was it from the bowels of the organization or you or, or who, well, who drove it? You know, I have to give a lot of credit to the late uh, Jim Bowen, who was the president emeritus at the time of his death of the West Virginia AFL-CIO. And many people knew Jim Bowen. He was a well-known man who... Uh, was an advocate for the working uh, family, working uh, people. And, you know, he talked to us uh, up at the, he was always at the legislature during the session. Even after he moved to Florida, he would come back and attend the sessions. And before he passed, he sat down and talked with both Dale Lee and myself. And he said, guys, you know, why are you all not joining together in one it makes more sense so we started the talk and we have to give him a lot of credit for for bringing us together uh it had always been discussed back in i believe it was 1998 1997 or 1998 on the national level both aft nationally and nea had talks of merging nationally and and that for whatever reason didn't go through but there are other states who have done this, five in fact. Minnesota, and I've mentioned this before, I believe, Minnesota just celebrated their 28th anniversary of a merger. And uh, it has been very successful. They're called Education Minnesota. Uh, so we, have, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's already been done, and it's been done successfully. Also in Montana, North Dakota, New York, and Florida, those are other states that have gone through a merger. So we have relied upon their expertise. And two gentlemen who helped with the Minnesota merger uh, come in periodically and talk with Dale Lee and myself. And they've been very instrumental in facilitating a lot of the uh, merger ideas. Fred, let's uh, turn our attention to PEIA, the increasing premiums <laughs> and the uh, also the deductibles and such, and the yeah. rumblings of a potential strike at some point uh, in the future if this doesn't uh, get resolved to the likings of the two unions. Can you address that? Well, you know, uh, we haven't we haven't been talking about a strike, but we have been talking to, and this is a, this is a perfect opportunity for both. AFT West Virginia and WVEA to work together, and we've already started that, uh, reaching out to our members. We have certain things that we're asking them to do, like, number one, show up at these public hearings and let your voice be heard, because we were told last week at the PEIA Finance Board meeting that they do listen to the comments, and those comments that are made either online or at the public hearings are recorded 
and they do pay attention to them. Uh, that doesn't always change things, but at least we're told they pay attention to them. So that's one of the things that we're asking our members to do now. We're asking them to reach out to their legislators during the interim committee meetings, and not just through an email, but have some conversations with their legislators, because this is going to be pretty devastating. Um, you know, we had Senate Bill 268 uh, two years ago that was passed. And we were told then that that was going to uh, be a way to help right this ship. Um, well, here we are again two years later, and that was a 24, maybe 24.2 percent increase in premiums. And now here we are this past year, uh, July 1, we had another 10.5 percent increase. And now we're talking about the next plan year. Uh, we'll have a 14% uh, increase in premiums. Co-pays are going to go up. Um, Out-of-pocket expenses will go up. So, And retirees are going to be affected uh, with this latest proposal. So there are public hearings that are going to start November the 7th, I believe, is the first one in Raleigh County. Uh, we're coming to your part of the country uh, later on. I believe that's on the 12th of November. It is, yes. So that... That's one of the things that we're asking both AFT West Virginia and uh, WVEA members to show up at those meetings, but other public employees also who will be affected by these increases. Do you all have a proposed solution that you're bringing to the table? Well, you know, that's one of the things that we would like to have the opportunity to sit down and talk. You know, we had a task force back in 2018 and 19 that was started and then just pretty much dissolved, we would like to have that task force uh, back um, so that we can sit down and talk about some solutions and, and be creative and see what we can do to uh, curtail further. We, we don't expect to not have some skin in the game. We expect to have increases along the way, but these hefty increases or what hurt. There's some talk among some legislators just to do away with PAA altogether. Uh, what is your position on that, Fred? Uh, not a good, not a good one. Uh, you, you know, they did that with uh, workers comp and that might be better for the employer, but it's not so much, uh, it's not so great for the employee, for the, the worker. And, and let's go back and you've heard this, over and over and over again. These benefits were given to the hardworking school teachers and service personnel and other public employees like police and firemen in lieu of raises over the years. Um, so, you know, that's taking away when you, when you change it drastically. I don't think that's the solution that we would be looking for. Why is that? Would you? What are some of the disadvantages of, of doing away well, with PEA? Well, uh, because you know, you you compare the uh, salaries of some of our state workers, public employees, and they're not the same as some of the salaries in the private sector, and it it brings a greater burden to those people, and especially to our retirees, our retirees who dedicated their lives to educating our children or feeding our children or being in public service to our children and now they're on a truly fixed income where they don't get a cola and to then have these major increases that is that is pretty hard to to uh, take fred how do you adequately solve a problem in a state that is such a national problem and that is the cost of health care and medicine in this country well, one of the things I think that we should do is look at the cost of, and what we've been told is that it's the prescription drugs that are driving up the cost. So let's look at why are prescription drugs so, uh, you know, out of reach for people? Why are they so expensive when they, they don't necessarily cost that much to produce, but we understand that some people can go online and get a, a drug much cheaper than they can get at their local drugstore. Why is that? 
And I think that that's one of the things that we could definitely look at. Why are these drugs driving up the cost of health insurance? And that makes up a large percentage of, like you said, the cost of some drugs on a monthly basis for people is overwhelming to the point where if you didn't have insurance at all, you just would not be able to afford it. Right. And, and you know, some of our senior citizens who deserve to be retired with dignity and be able to live a comfortable life, they have to make a choice of whether they're going to go grocery shopping or drug shopping, you know, get their drugs that they, they need to survive in many cases. So it is it is really a, a problem, but I'm sure there's solutions that we can look at. We as a state, <clears throat> excuse me, we help companies all the time with tax breaks. Uh, let's help our own. Let's help our own citizens live a life of that they enjoy and one where they don't have to worry about the cost of health care. But it is a national problem that definitely needs to be addressed, and we need to to make sure that we are going to address it. Fred Albert, our guest here. Go ahead, John. Is the the state retirement programs, is it the defined benefits kind of program that is the a certain percentage of the top three years salary, that kind of a program? That is the uh, what we call the old uh, teacher's retirement system or the old old system. Uh, yes, that that is the defined benefit. And does that make them not eligible for Medicare? Is it a different kind of program? No, you, you, you can actually, you know, when you become that age where you are Medicare eligible, no, you can you can still draw. You can use Medicare. You can. You are mel- Medicare eligible. Now, your problems with PEIA, do you talk to the PEIA board or you actually talk to the legislators? It's the legislators that need to be talked to. I mean, we, we talk with them, uh, and we talk to the finance board, uh, Dale Lee and myself. We go to all of the uh PEIA finance board hearings, and we listen to the reports, and we do talk to them, but their hands are pretty much tied. They have to deal with the money that they're given. It is up to the legislators to appropriate the money in the PEIA. So those are the, the people that we really need to have a conversation with. Well, going back to what we talked about a second ago, uh, listening to some of the local legislators, they feel in a heightened level of frustration, and I think their knee-jerk reaction is to just let's get out of the business altogether. So h- how compelling an argument are you going to have uh, besides just the salaries to convince the legislators not to take this more, in their view, more convenient approach? Well, that's why we need to have the task force back in – business or back, you know, at the table so that we can look at all options and explore. But uh, they need to be involved. They need to listen to their constituents. You know, in some of the areas where legislators live, uh, the the largest employer are the school districts or um, other public services. So they need to listen to their constituents and talk with them and have conversations. And that's what, another thing that we're encouraging our members to do is to reach out to your legislator and let them know your situation. Uh, but bringing the back to task force, I think, is where we sit down at the table, all stakeholders, and we have some deep conversations about what can be done. How can we uh, avert a future increases and and we don't expect to not have increases in premiums and copays but a lot at one time is hard to deal with i i want to go back to the to the retirees having sure. recently just negotiated the third circle of hell that is called medicare and and just getting into that program the supplemental programs that are available are are numerous Retirees are not tied to PEIA for their supplemental coverage. They can do Medicare and then any number of different plans, right? Right. Uh, PEIA does have a good plan for retirees with uh, PEIA Humana, from what I understand. And, and, you know, I'm at that place in my life where I'm going to be looking at that as well. Uh, So that's another thing that you need to – be able to reach out to people, have those conversations, 
um, and and make wise decisions when you do retire. Talk to other retirees about, and that's what I've done about what plan they chose, but you are right. There are other plans that you can choose. Uh, that's just a personal decision, but you have to, like anything else, uh, retirement is a big decision. And when you make that uh, decision, you, you rely on people who have experience and knowledge to help guide you through that whole process. But you are correct. There are other other plans out there. Aetna is another one. I get mail every day. Uh, or phone calls at home, uh, they must they must know what my plan is uh, <laughs> because they're they're you know wanting me to sign up for supplemental insurance. Fred, thanks so much for your time this morning. Much appreciated. Thank you, and I look forward to maybe talking to you in the future at some point. But thank you always for having me on your show. And a big good morning to Jackie Long. I'm sure she's listening. She is. She I is. saw her name in the comments section. Thank you, Fred. <laughs> thanks. Fred. Thanks so much.